Hi there, welcome to the More Simple Podcast. This is a podcast for Blacks, Asians, and those who love them. I am Mo, and I am your host, ready to spark your curiosity as I take you on this adventurous ride of exploring cultures through the stories of my guests from all over the world. On this show, we get really personal, discussing salient issues that are relevant to our contemporary age and also building community around them. As our guests exercise courage and vulnerability in sharing their life's experiences, we hope that in turn, you are inspired by them and that you get the courage in it to set your own stories free. Enjoy the ride and thank you so much for listening. Ah, well, hello everybody. Welcome back to the show. And today, um, no, it's not a video. Stop doing the kiss. No, oh, it's not a video. Yeah, I'm not gonna be using the video. Whatever. <laughs> Very much. He was actually bringing you guys a kiss. So today I have my my mister from another mother, um, the one and only T Dog, back on the show, and it's. This is a very, I don't know, impromptu episode to to kind of explore together. And up until yesterday, I didn't think I was going to do any topic, this particular topic. But I do not believe in coincidences. And so shout out to a very good friend of mine. I'm going to call her O, by the way. And she's going to know I'm going to be friends. So I don't want to talk about her identity she was the inspiration behind this so she had reached out to me um on friday and today's sunday by the way uh, it was a thursday night telling me um so for context she has been trying to get her green card and she finally got a message from the um what's the green card people yes 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 about going to do, you know, biometrics, which is like a good step because they've acknowledged your application. Now they want you to go and do your biometrics. And she proceeded to let me know that, oh, it's been a long time coming. She's very thankful to God. I have no idea what they've gone through. And even though she said that, you know, not knowing what I've gone through, it struck a chord with me, like, <laughs> you don't know what it's like. You think I don't know what it's like. And so I proceeded to send her like a 10 minute long voice note telling her about all of our stories in the condensed form. And she was like, oh my goodness, you've gone through that? I'm like, yes. And that story barely, you know, um, scratches the surface. So this is a very long introduction. Um, as Christians, we believe that we became the devil, devil by the word of the Lamb, but by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. So we're here today to just talk about our uh, you know, immigration experience to the U.S. Not many people know this story. And as the things we do on the show, it's a way to encourage those that might probably be going through this and also to um, just to give them that, I guess, hope that it gets better, Even especially when things are really, really bad and you feel like you are at the end of your game, you feel like the greatest loser on earth. There's always a way out, and we believe in God, so we definitely know that if not for God, we probably won't be where we are today. So that's really the um, premise of this conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming back my husband and my very good friend and baby daddy, T-Dog. What's up? Hey, yo, yo, yo. Hello, y'all. It's nice to be here again. So he actually has his phone on and he's watching tennis on the side while he's on the podcast. You multitask, right? <laughs> you only have limited minutes, so. Yeah, by the way, he's telling me I have 30 minutes. Otherwise, he's going to charge me 200 bucks. So this is going to be a fairly short episode. So just for context, um, and do you want me to start on you, dude? Yeah, go ahead. You only yawn, yawn all the time you come on the show. You yawn a lot. Yeah, live up the doctor. We haven't even started and you're yawning. Anyways, um, so for context, when we were still dating in Nigeria, this was probably about 
How many years ago was that? You went to your first interview. Mm, first interview, probably. That was 2008, 9, maybe. And I think it was maybe 8 or so. Anyway, for the longest time I've known Thai, I always wanted to come to the US. I really know why. Um, I think I, I kind of understood why his brother, so his older brother has always been here. And so he wanted to, you know, walk in his brother's steps and come to the US. But it felt very obsessive to me in a way, like his desire to come here. And I just wasn't into that. And so I know the first time he told me he wanted to come visit his brother, he went for the visa interview and they rejected him at the embassy. And his visa, that is. And then the second time he went, trying to use, like, go through, like, a conference route to attend a conference in the U.S., and he was denied. But then I just stopped there. Um, Taiwan got to know about this country republic. Uh, do you remember then? Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. There's this um, country republic. Uh, is it, is a part of, is it, is it, I think it's a, I think it's a city or somewhere in Key West, Florida. They've been trying to, you know, um, secede from the U.S. for the longest time and they're trying to make it seem like a real country. He found some information about applying directly to country public to get into the U.S. And I thought, ah, this is hella sus. I'm not into it. And then you found about these people in on those states in Nigeria where it almost like in deptitude, you come, they will take, a, take away your passport. You remember? No, the way, yeah, the way they did it then or they proposed it was... <laughs> You know, pretty much, you know, they would um, help you get into school, pay your school fees and everything, help you settle into the U.S. and eventually get your, I guess, green card and stuff. But they're going to hold on to your passport and everything until you fulfill the terms of the contract, I guess. Um, So kind of sound like not a bad deal then, especially if you were desperate. (laughs) You know, but looking back at it, that was, we're just playing out slavery. No, I, I told you right away that I wasn't into that. I said it was very suspicious. Anyway, so I might just walk through that journey to let you know, because it's going to play a lot of role into our current state. So I wasn't really keen about the U.S. I knew I wanted to travel abroad to study. France was going to be my, um, was my, used to be my top choice. Was I was learning French way back then. And but then I kind of let that dream die. It wasn't any something I really wanted to do anymore. And then um, my roommate, I was actually going to go to the UK. Uh, I applied to some colleges there. I got admission into Aston University to study something on drug delivery. I got five thousand pounds off of my tuition, which was a good deal then. But I realized that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Plus, I felt like I was settling for less. So thanks to my roommate who told me, you need to, like, you know, aim higher, like, try the U.S. If I were you, I would go to the best, you know, meaning the U.S. So, um, took my exams, GRE, the TOEFL, and finally got into the U.S., and um, I got into University of Texas at Austin. Now, we got married August of... You forgot when we got married again? That was a trick question. We got married when? December. June 2011. (laughs) And then I was supposed to resume school in August. So that August, we both went to the embassy together to get our passport, our visa for the U.S. Um, to get to enter the U.S., right? Mm-hmm. You want to summarize a little bit what that was like? Yeah, just to give a little bit of context, um, I had been denied twice, Um Previously in Lagos, and uh, we decided that you know to increase our chances or our odds of you know getting the visas approved, you know we chose a different location in Abuja. So we made that trip to Abuja, you know, stayed in a, in a friend's house and all that, and you know went for the interview. Went pretty well, you know. We we're advised by my uncle, a professor here in the states, and he was like, "We should go for the interview together." You know, that if we went as a couple, that would increase our odds of you know getting approved, and so we did. Uh, so we thought, you yeah. know, everything went well, and at the point in the interview, it felt like the interview was just 
Funny. get around me. <laughs> you know, they kept asking me, you know, what are you going to go do in the States? You know, you're a doctor. Wow, well, your wife is schooling. What are you going to be doing? Are you going to, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be there to support my wife, blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, so what are you going to be doing? And I said, you know, I'm going to be... Um, writing. I'm going to be writing. And I said, hmm, interesting. What kind of books you know, do you plan to write? And I said, romance. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought about that on the spot, by the way. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just came to my mind. I didn't really... Yeah, I don't know where that came from, but maybe that's one of the things I still have to do. Who knows? But I typically don't lie. Um, but anyway, anyways, um, we were granted at the visas, and when we went to pick up the visas, cut the long story short, um, we were both issued F1 visas, you know, and to the average Nigerian, they would have, you know... No, let's explain a little bit what F1 is. I know. Okay. So, to the average Nigerian, they would have thought, oh, that God has done it, you know, that instead of F2, we got F1. So F2, by the way, is like a dependent visa, meaning that, you know, my visa is contingent on her, which is the F1, F1 holder. Yeah. Um, and you can't work, you can't do anything, pretty much. Which explains why the uh, consular officer was asking, what will you be doing while your wife is in school? Exactly. Yeah. So um, the issue both of us F1, and I didn't have any admission to go to school and all. So immediately we reached out to the embassy and, you know, Nobody picked up the phone. We sent an email and letting them know of their mistake or the error and all that stuff. Anyway, all those went unanswered. You know, our calls were unreturned. You know, emails were unanswered. And fast forward, uh, was it a month or two later? No, a month, baby. It was like maybe a week. After you had traveled yes. away to the States. Yes. You know, um, I got an email while I was at work then um, on the island. Uh, stating that we have a, both of us had our visas cancelled for fraudulent documents against the US government. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my god, I started freaking out. I'm like, what? Like, what is this all about? You know. So immediately, I contacted her, and she contacted her school. Her school started corresponding with the embassy in Nigeria, and all that good stuff. Anyway, in long story short, I had to reappear for another interview. I had to fly back to Abuja the second time um, you know, for another interview because they said that was issued in error. And since we had notified them of their error, you know, they realized that they were the ones that made a mistake. But anyway, people, to cut the long story short, she... Um, I went for the interview and they were still looking at ways to deny my visa. You know, they were asking me if I plan to take the USMLE and all that stuff. You know, questions that were, you know, tricky, you know. Trying to, trying to see if I was going to sleep, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, they reissued the visa. And when I picked up the visa, um, lo and behold, it was still F1. And then the road derivative of Motolani Ogunsoya. You know, pretty much still the F1 and then the derivative of R. Yeah, they just put a colon because they couldn't issue another visa to him. And so, two things from this whole thing is number one, those that email that was sent informing them of their mistake in the first place, that ended up being our saving grace because they made it seem like we set out to defraud them in the first place, which doesn't make sense. We both had the interview done together, right? And they kept asking him as a dependent, so they knew he was going to get an F2. And it, and the way the visa system works, where you go for your interview is different from where you go get your passport when it has been stamped, especially when you're approved, right? And I was the one that noticed it. So, and <laughs> let me just say, when Taiwo panics, you know, it's not good. You know, the anxiety is just transferred to me. But another thing I want to just say is that for those that are planning to come to the U.S., make sure your school has a very strong international office. I don't care how much they're giving you in, in scholarships and um, waivers and all that. If they don't have a liaison office to represent you as an international student, don't even bother going to that school. And you don't know how much you need this kind of representation until when things like this happen to you. So I remember just walking into the office that day, sometime in August. Imagine just being a fresh um, immigrant to the U.S., by yourself, newly married. Your husband isn't here because he was planning to come later that year to join me. And you got this email from the embassy saying you guys are frauds. 
a Nigerian and your husband is like, you know, many, many miles away and the time difference between both of you. I just walked into the office and I just, the first person that came to meet me at the door, I just plumped into her seat. I just like, I said, really, where do I start from? You know, where do I start from in my twenties against the U.S. government? And as God will have it, she, that lady, Laura Straw, by the way, and I can never forget her name. She has, um, she had a friend who worked in Abuja, the consular office. What are the odds? You know, a lady from Texas. Um, so he went back, got the interview, did, came back to, had to go do the interview again, right? And then he got the, the correction made. And then they amended it by just putting colon derivative of then put my full my legal name Matola Nebuzaya. And then what happened? Yeah, so I just got tired of the whole issue. So I just came. I said I was going to travel with the visa. So I came in at the port of entry. They checked me in as F1, which is a student instead of a derivative of a student. You know, so. Like, I, let me just chime in here. People are those those guys at the port of entry. The officers there. A lot of them don't know a lot about the visa issues that you might have or the visa categories. That all had to like even almost like educate them what was going on. But yeah, I thought that was very interesting. But well, go ahead. Yeah, so I narrated it briefly to her and she told me she was going to have to cancel my visa and um, send me to the back. Little did I know that that was the beginning of, <laughs> you know, um, an interesting journey. So anyway, um, I was... There, I saw people coming in and leaving, you know, people that met me there. I stayed there for, God knows, maybe eight hours or ten yeah. hours, God yeah. knows how long. Mm-hmm. You know, I missed my connecting flight. You know, I had to stay in a hotel. You know, what? You know, and she and, you know, the family she was staying with then, you know, were waiting up for me at, at the airport. airport. There was no way to contact them. It yep. was just a mess, you know. Anyway, eventually... We had to call um, America, was it Qatar? Because you came into Qatar and they were supposed to come through American Airlines from Houston to Austin. They confirmed to us that he got on the flight. So I knew at least he was still alive, you know. <laughs> so anyway, they had to check me in, you know, give me a visa waiver. You know, that was what I was admitted into the U.S. with. Not the visa, because the visa was the wrong one, you know, so. Do you have to explain what the visa waiver means? Yeah, so I didn't come in with a visa, which is very un. This is not the, it's not um, the, the norm, norm yeah. you know, for Nigerians. I know there are some countries that um, that the U.S. does visa waivers for. Yeah. Like, they don't have to get a visa to come to the States. Yeah. Um, probably, like, I think Canada is probably one of them. Koreans, like, countries with, like, very strong Henley index. Like, their passports have, like, they have, like, you know, strong passports, yeah. Anyway, due to the uniqueness of my case, they gave me a visa waiver, and they stamped canceled on my visas you know so but they warned him that if he leaves the country go ahead yeah at that point i I felt like oh my god like i'm stuck in the u.s until i get the green card that's what i thought you know but anyway thankfully i was able to you know change my status while i was here oh before then you know i was trying to renew my you know um driver's license and all that stuff they they couldn't find me in the system oh yeah so what texas does is when you're uh, and immigrants, you, uh, well, I don't know if it's applicable to all immigrants, but for students, immigrants, you get one year conditional visa, and then after one year, you're supposed to come back again. And based on your I 20, you can get maybe up to two, five years, depending on the length of stay you have. So after the one year had elapsed now, and Tyler went to the um, the license, the driver license, the DPS, to get his um, license renewed so he can drive and whatever. He got there, they said, ah, we can't find him in the system. And like, ah, but he came here last year, you gave him a driver's license. How can you not find him in the system? Well, apparently, when they do the updates, because of the, he was no longer on a visa, technically, he was on a waiver, the system didn't catch his name. And then we now had to go back. You know how you've never finished metabolizing trauma from the US government? We now had to go back again. My school started having to email Department of Homeland Security. It was just a horrible mess. Like, you see cops sometimes, you have to be going up. I remember those times that, you know, 
<laughs> can talk about that but can you tell us what was going on in your mind those days you were not at peace when you no, I was I can just imagine and I was legal I was legal in the US you know but I was still feeling like this because of my circumstances you know upon you know coming into the states now imagine what illegal you know immigrants Face, feel yeah you know yeah yeah it's it's that fun even that name self illegal i don't i don't like it. it it keeps nobody should be branded that name but i i, I get it but anyways those were not very interesting times and so we couldn't go home or he couldn't go home when his brother got married you know when big events happened back home we just couldn't go home um it wasn't like it was all bad because again it wasn't cheap home was like a thousand or some dollars you know far away so um towards the end of my degree in school Tao had started you know doing his um public health masters in public health at the other university whose name we're not going to mention on this podcast ever Jeez, like uh, a horrible school. Yeah, what do I guys say? Always hook him. So, no, it's not a horrible school, sorry. We just have this rivalry. My school and the school have this rivalry, and we just, it's a tongue in cheek rivalry. So, anyways, um, he was already getting his master's, and then Tyro being the king of information that he is, one, one, he's been trying to tell me about this national interest river thing, but I just used to dismiss it, like, I'm not even interested. But one night he finally convinced me, like, ah, if you do, you can get a green card and yada, yada, yada. All you have to do is this and that. He made it really sound very simple. But he didn't stop there. He told us about this lawyer that a pastor friend of his had introduced him to. And so we, I said, okay, let's just talk to the lawyer. Like, it's free consultation. Was it, do you pay? We didn't pay money then, right? And the lawyer made it sound, you know, oh, you guys are qualified. You know, he even, like, made some jokes. He was from Africa, not Nigeria, by the way, somewhere in the West. And so we proceeded to, like, go ahead and do it. Do you want to talk about what what happened next? Yeah. This was a really... This was another tumultuous um, time. This is Jerry Wood. It was was not fun at all. Um, We actually had to, you know, rake up all our savings. Yeah... You know, the guy gave us, like, really huge hopes. We had to, like, raise funds from family. You know, it was really, really rough. Yeah, I used my scholarship funds. Taiwo had to flip burgers, work um, sausage stands in concession to, like, save money for it. And I didn't, at least you didn't wash toilets, did you? (laughs) Anyway, I wasn't flipping the stuff. I was, what was I doing? You were selling the burgers. Was it sausage? I was a cashier. Yeah, well, he had that rough experience. That was a super bad According shit. to him, that was rough. <laughs> yeah, help dole up, dole up popcorn, you know, sausages and all that stuff during, during concessions. But anyway, we ripped up all this money, pumped it into the application process and, you know, spent close to $10,000. Just to cut a long story short, you know, God just made a way for us. You know, we got our application denied eventually. And um, I had to go through applying for. So yeah, um, we had to like, you know, put in quite an amount of money, almost ten thousand dollars. Imagine for a student, you know, and a spouse that's not working it was a rough time. Um, we got the work authorization, and thank so we did what we call concurrent filing, right? Yes, I feel like we've told this story before. Not in this way. Well, anyway, um, just got to the chase. Um, we got the work authorization. I started my residency on that. And then a couple of months into residency, the application got denied. And, you know, we're just trying to navigate, our, you know, what the next strategy was going to be. Fast forward a few months or years later, you know, we eventually got our green cards, you know. Um, but You're skipping through a lot. Yeah, I know. I know, hold on, because there's a lesson here. So, this lawyer we got was a horrible person. And I just say that... Yeah, I think it's a scammer, because he did like the same thing to... We found you know, out our friends. African healthcare workers who come to the U.S., that's his type. He preys on their vulnerabilities, 
And then and desperation. And desperation, yes. I had to write a heartfelt letter to the bar reporting him. Now, because he's a lawyer, he knows he does just the right minimum in such a way that you cannot sue him for negligence. But he would lie. He would say, oh, he's going to a car accident. He can't type. He didn't do anything on our case. Even when we got a, what you call an RFE, a request for more evidence, meaning we are at the verge of denying your case, but please provide us more evidence. This guy didn't take our case seriously. So anyways, it got denied. I remember when that email came or when, <laughs> like the website, USS, uscis.gov. I went there so many times. I even when I go on my Google browser, my Chrome browser, and I type in you, it will auto-populate, you know, and then I'll click on that website. I don't even have to put in my um, tracking ID. Once I put the first letter, not first number nine, it auto-completes it. So show you how many times I went there. So that day, I had gone to see Taiwan in New Mexico. I remember it was in August 2016. Of August 2016, I had gone to visit him, and I kept refreshing, always refreshing the page to see if there was like a new update. And then that particular day, it looked different, like there was an update. And I kept scrolling down. I just saw your case has been denied. Hey, guys, at that moment, when you said that you felt like you were at, like the world was on top of you, that was that moment for us. I had to wait until Tyler got back from work because I wanted to tell him in person. I didn't want to text him while I was at work. Even when I told him, he thought I was pranking him, you know. And we're like, what do we do? Meanwhile, he started his residency using the EAD card, that's the work authorization, you know, card from this, you know, pending um, case, right? So I had to tell his employer and, of course, I told him he might have to leave the program, which was kind of problematic because this was, like, the third... He got his residency on his third attempt. So, anyways, just to summarize that bit, we found a lawyer that someone introduced us to who was also a pastor, and he listened to us. I don't think he even paid him anything. The lawyer advised us on what to do, and he was able to use his master's degree to, you know, finish his residency. So all of that to just say, the same lawyer, lawyer category of people who disappointed us, or the same category of people God used to help us. And I remember when I was trying to get my get a job, one of the first things I told my employer then, my prospective employer was, hey, we need a green card. And they're like, oh, yeah, they were going to work on that. So um, I got my job, and then they started filing. Worry also helped me again. So the lesson here is that be very forthcoming and forthright with your prospective employers. I had to put the cards on the table. Like, I like this position, and I think I'm a good fit for it. But here are my conditions, you know. I need a green card for my husband, and I need it as soon as, you know, tomorrow. You know, as soon as yesterday, I needed like yesterday, and so there was no hiding, trying to like go behind corners. And I know that some of for some of you that might be listening, you might not be in the same position to be that forthright to your employers. But as soon as you can have that conversation, I highly, highly, you know, encourage you to have that conversation. Or what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, I think that's something that has to come up at the beginning. But some people might be scared because they might feel to deter the employer from offering them the job. Um, so I, I know friends that have started a job and then asked the employers and some of them were like, uh, we can't do this, we've never done this before, you know, and some will be like, sure, we can help, you know, so, yeah. I'm not going to support you. I don't think you even need to be in, the, in that place in, in the first place. Because for my school, it was it wasn't even like a no brainer. They were, were willing to support. So we put in the application the same year. And as I should say, I went from my F1 to H1B. I didn't even have to use my OPT. That's another testimony. Anyways, um, they started filing for it. You will not believe it that within a year we got our green card. Which, when I called the school's lawyer who was assigned to my case. I emailed her, I was like, hey, are you in your office? This was BC, by the way, before COVID. I'd like to stop by and see you. She was like, okay. So I go to her office and I told her, well, we just had our interview and guess what? We were approved. She goes, when she got my email, that there was no way, she, she was so sure that I wasn't, I wasn't coming to her that I'd gotten the green card, that there was no way it could have been that fast. 
guys, it was so fast. In fact, on the day of the interview, do you remember? Mm -hmm. So the guy, the officer, he came to the door to escort us in. And then no sooner had we even sat down, so he read the right and, you know, said that we swear everything we're going to tell him the truth. We say, yeah, so help me God. He said, I've already gone ahead to approve you guys, actually. This is just a formality. I have read all of the things you've done. You've done so much for the U.S. Um, um, your, your, your research, your work, both of you. And it just felt good to hear the same U.S. government who accused us of being fraudulent many months ago being the same person telling us, you know, well done, my children, you have done so well. It felt really good. And I knew at that moment it was God sent because as an immigrant, sometimes you feel so powerless against the U.S. government. You feel like, you know, you're doing so much and I'm even getting that credit and getting recognized for. And he was like, I'm going to do something, you know, good for you guys. Usually this card should come in like in two weeks time, but I, I had it extradited. So you're going to get it by the end of the week. And guys, you know, that week we got our green card and, and that was it. You know, that was it. It's been almost, it's been three years now, almost three years now. And it's just been nothing but God's grace. And so getting that text from my friend saying, oh, you have no idea what I'm going through. Not in that way that she said it. I thought it was just experience to talk about that. A lot of us, we go through so many things and we've, we're no longer in that zip code anymore, but we shouldn't forget to come and share the story. So I hope that those that are listening to this, you're encouraged. Number one, keep your email trail, trails. Number two, seek help. Number three, the place of prayers and engage your friends. We had a lot of our family, our family members, our friends, um, just, you know, encouraging us, praying with us, you know, our small groups. I mean, these people were so, so helpful. The emails we sent to the embassy then when they accused us of, you know, defrauding them, it was so emotional for us. But we had friends helping us, you know, read through the emails before we could send them out and make sure that we're very, you know, we're strong advocates for our case. What else, you? Yeah, I think you uh, covered pretty much. Yeah, so if you're going through this, don't give up, you know. Um, I know it sounds very scary. I know it's overwhelming. Perhaps you've had to shut yourself away from the world. You don't want to, you know, um, be out there anymore because you're trying to lay low. I might not really understand everything you're going through, but I just want to let you know that, you know, it gets better. Just keep trusting in God. It gets better. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, we took the, the long route, you know, which is the right route. Um, I remember when we first got here, you know, we had friends and, you know, we one family member that was saying, you know, do we, you know, are there are ways you can get your green cards quicker? Yeah. You know, you know, through some shabby means I'll not even mention. Um, but anyway, I'm glad we went through this. We learned a lot along the way and we've been able to be a blessing to other people, you know, down this journey as well. So Wow. So that's it guys. Um this has been the episode with um T Dog and Mo. And if you have questions or how we can even encourage you in your own journey. Put some comments out there or share this episode with some of your friends who might be going through immigration issues. Or just email us. Um, you can check the website for how to you know, contact us directly. Well, um, catch you guys on another episode of the Most Simple Podcast. I remain your host, Most Simple. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Morrisable Podcast. Well, guess what? There's plenty more where that came from. So visit our website at www.mosibyl.com. That is www.mosibyl.com, where you can find hours of other binge-worthy episodes just like this one. And while you're at it, please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Podbean as it encourages other awesome people like you to listen to the podcast as well. We are now officially on Podbean. It has an app. You can catch up on missed episodes and also get a notification when we have new episodes. Do you have a question for our guest, feedback on the episode, or a suggestion for a future guest? Then please get in touch with us by sending us an email at talktomo at mostable.com or connect with us via Instagram at the Moral Civil Podcast. Cannot wait to hear from you and thank you so much for always listening.